So now we start the general discussion or presentation session about volumetric models. And it is a real pleasure for me to be at LIPS for the first time and uh, being able to present what we do and see what other people do with volumetric models in the practice of the uh, planetarium um, for young people, older people, and everybody around. And uh, Dana Thompson and uh, Keith Davis will help us in the second part with a demonstration of these capabilities on the dome. This will be uh, about volumetric present, uh, models in live presentations. And for those who are joining only this session, Nico will briefly uh, summarize or outline again what we understand uh, volumetric models are. And after that, I will shortly um, discuss a little bit more what the science is behind the volumetric models and how we uh, obtain the third dimension along the line of sight, the structure that is hidden actually in any image that we have from the sky. That's the key issue. And uh, after that, Dana and Keith will present uh, real-time applica real applications of the models on dome and afterwards we can have uh, questions and answers and a bit of discussion of the topic in general and the experience from other people and maybe feedback from the visitors that uh, would be very interesting to hear about okay nico okay so basically i'm just going to repeat what i did if did a few minutes ago um so if there's anybody new that's joined since then, then, then good. Um, otherwise, well, bear with me while I repeat what I said. Um, I'm just going to go over what volumetric models are and how they're different than the standard way of doing uh, volumes in computer graphics. Um, the usual way to represent volumes is called surface mapping, uh, where a slightly deformed surface um, has a texture applied to it. Um, which is a good method for, like I said, solar system objects that are opaque and round, um, but nebulae are transparent mostly, and they're usually not round, so the method doesn't work very well. Um, they've they've been they've been used um, for nebulae, and they look okay uh, from a distance, but once you get close and look around it, um, you can see the sharp edges of the surface. Um, so for nebulae, at least, we need a better way to display these objects. Um, so in a volumetric model, each voxel in space is assigned a brightness and, uh, and an opacity. Um, and a voxel, by the way, is, is a pixel, but a volume pixel. So we call it a voxel. So it's a, it's a um, piece of space, basically. Um, so each voxel has a brightness and opacity signed to it, and um, the image is projected onto the dome by summing all of the voxels along the line of sight in kind of a ray tracing manner. Um, so you can fly around and through these objects seamlessly because uh, they act more like how real gas would. Um, by, by that I mean it's everywhere in space and not just confined to a surface. Now the idea of a volumetric model can be, um, can be somewhat confusing. When we talk about volumes, uh, what we mean is what I just mentioned, that every point in space has a brightness and opacity. Uh, what we don't mean um, is the idea of flying through something and seeing it on all sides as you look around, um, such as an asteroid field, for example. Uh, when you fly through an asteroid field, it feels like a volume. Uh, you're flying through it, but each asteroid is a surface mapped object. So, um, a volumetric model is one where all voxels contain a brightness and those are summed up and it's not just a bunch of um, solid objects that have textures applied to them. So that's kind of what we mean by a volumetric model. Okay, Wolfgang. Okay. Um, so what is the science about uh, the volumetrics? How do we get the third dimension structure along the line of sight? Uh, the solution is um, the solution depends strongly on what time of type of object we have. Here on the right at the top, we have the, the galaxy with the radio emission from 
um, jets and dust, opaque dust in, in the plane of the galaxy. And in the middle, we have an expanding nebula, bipolar nebula that becomes bigger and bigger with time. And at the bottom, we have a, a big galaxy, volumetric galaxy that is a mixture of gas, dust, and point-like stars that uh, um, interact with each other. But uh, each model needs a different approach in, in the construction, in the reconstruction. So um, one solution that has been applied to a few objects was uh, invented by uh, computer graphicists with an interest in astronomy a few years ago that are at the Technical University in Braunschweig in Germany. Uh, for some planetary nebulae that kind of lie in the plane of the sky or nearly in the plane of the sky, they develop an algorithm that automatically and iteratively uh, reconstructs the nebula from a single image, say from a space telescope image. Uh, at the top you can see the ant nebula um, in the middle clean from the stars. And that image is then used to reconstruct the 3D structure of the model, but with the important constraint that it has a cylindrical symmetry. That is uh, kind of filaments that are spikes are also converted into uh, uh, circles, basically around an axis. That constraint is needed to make it possible to reconstruct it from a single image. And that is of course visible in the end in the reconstruction on the right. Many of you probably have uh, four or five of those models in your um, planetarium system to show to the public. Um, if those constraints cannot be met, which is the case for most other objects, we need other constraints to obtain the third dimension. And in planetary nebula and in expanding nebula in general, a very important information, a scientific information is the velocity along the line of sight, which can be obtained with high resolution spectroscopic observations, uh, which are often done on this type of objects. In the middle, uh, we see a sequence of velocity uh, spectra, basically, of the ant nebula at different positions um, across the nebula. And that information maps in an expanding nebula, that's very important, maps roughly to the position along the line of sight. So these are basically slices through the object with some restrictions um, whenever uh, the velocity field does not follow an explosive ballistic expansion, then there are distortions, which as astrophysicists, we sometimes can take into account and uh, uh, interpret accordingly the observations that have been obtained and build them into our models. Mm -hmm. At the bottom, you see our model of the Ant Nebula that was reconstructed uh, based on images and uh, this kind of velocity information. Symmetry and uh, continuity of structures is, is an important additional um, constraint. Now, what if we are looking at a galaxy or uh, more interestingly, even at a, a star formation region with a lot of dust being illuminated um, from a cluster or a single star in the middle, then the illumination of the dust is also an important constraint and gives us a hints towards where the structures are with related uh, with respect to each other and to the illuminating stars in the middle. In addition, non-optical uh, information from infrared, X-ray or radio observations uh, can help locate uh, where different areas of an object are. And of course, very importantly, the overall theory of uh, the object is, is a key constraint. For example, an expand, expanding nebula, such as planetary nebulae, we know which, which parts are moving faster and which are moving slower. And uh, we have to be careful, therefore, in the interpretation of the spectra, for example. 
or in star forming regions, we know that they are mostly caves within um, molecular clouds and dust clouds. So we can take that information into account as well. Often that is not enough and uh, there is no way to have full constraints on the reconstruction. Then we have to make additional assumptions or scientifically reasonable extrapolations uh, mm, alias guesses, scientifically based if possible. Otherwise we, we can interpolate, say, or add structure that we believe are scientifically justifiable and reasonable. So what are the main challenges that we face uh, in addition to those constraints? One is that we cannot of, often cannot preserve the, uh, the quality of imaging when we pass the information from the physical modeling to the GPU rendering um, for the real-time visualization. There is a loss in dynamic range and we have to take into account those losses already in the modeling, uh, which limits the possibilities of making actual physical models to in all detail. And real-time radiation transfer uh, is possible today, but uh, to make that universally, universally Hello. useful might take some more time, a few years or so. Um, spatial resolution is another one. When we fly into the nebula or a galaxy, for example, then there's a limit. Usually we have 512 cube um, models that uh, when you fly into them and look at them in detail, small scale features, they will be visible as uh, splotches or, or clouds that are not very well defined. Improving that in the future is a main topic of investigation or research. Animation more uh, than just flying around with a camera is an important topic for future research. And we have demonstrated that animation changing the structure of the object is possible in real time, but uh, is very heavy load on the graphics uh, soft, uh, hardware and will be a topic of investigation or research in few years time to become really practical. Standard volumetric formats should be introduced in the next few years to make it easier to have physics-based visualization uh, across the different systems. That's another topic that we will look into. Okay, so in the future, the main topics are multi-resolution models that can we can, so we can fly into them uh, and preserve the level of details we can see and physics-based real-time rendering is the key topic as well. So that ends my presentation right now. I stop sharing. If there is any questions right away, or shall we take them after Dana and uh, Keith present? Hello. Hi, everyone. Nice to How's see you. It? Nice to see you too. Uh, thanks so much for those uh, previous presentations. They helped me understand uh, volumetric models myself a little bit better. I use this stuff so much, but I don't really learn the vocab or the science behind it. Um, so I'm going to focus my part of my presentation or the presentation here today on engagement, which I really think is what live interactive planetarium programming is really about. Um, so I'm Dana Thompson, the Planetarium Director at Ball State University in Indiana in the States here. And um, I'm also one of the board representatives for the International Planetarium Society, one of two for the United States with Michelle here. Um, so let's start with um, some chat activities here. Uh, let me bring up the chat so I can see it nicely. And um, I just want you to, in the chat here, Considering what we've learned about volumetric models so far today, what's one volumetric model in your system that you have used or you know is there? Or maybe it's not in your planetarium system, but it's something online that you've used in the past. All right, lots for Milky Way. Uh, there's Orion Nebula, Crab Nebula, Orion, the Orion Nebula fly through. Keith, you just sent that just to me. Um, 
the Milky Way. Yeah, a lot of Milky Way here. And that was one of my um, thoughts of what a volumetric model example was in my system. But some people might consider that more of a hybrid model where it's individual stars that you can fly through or fly around or in between, but then also some clouds of gas that are more volumetric. Um, so there's a helix nebula. Uh, we have that on our system and I'll show you some of that too. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of nebulae and galaxies out there. Uh, we saw some other examples and there might be other things like black holes one day that we can um, fly into um, in some ways. So yeah, magnetosphere, that's really great. All right, so what's um, maybe a model that's on your system, but you're not really sure if it's volumetric or not. Like I wasn't sure if our Milky Way model was volumetric and I guess it's a hybrid, which is a whole nother um, term for me to learn. And then what is it if it's not a volumetric model? Is it just a 3D model? But it's a little bit more than a 3D model if it's a whole bunch of asteroids in an asteroid field because you can manipulate it a little bit. You can fly through Saturn's rings a little bit and see it from different angles but there's not that light all around you that's really making it, I guess, volumetric. So what's something else in your system that you're not sure if it's volumetric or not? I don't know about you, but we have some cutaways of uh, the planets and we can see the inside and we can kind of fly in, but not really. Um, but yeah, like asteroids, Saturn's rings, maybe some of you are now thinking that maybe your Milky Way model isn't a volumetric model, but a hybrid, like I mentioned, right? We have all these models on our system and some of them are true volumetric models. Some of them are hybrids and some of them are just 3D models or groups of 3D models that we can still interact with. Um, and we can do a lot of things with them. Um, this is not on our system, but I found it of the Crab Nebula, this volumetric model of it. Um, I think, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong though, but we can fly into it and see it from different angles and really start to understand this process of a star dying. And this is really engaging, or we hope it is to people, right? Uh, the link um, for this is uh, not here, but the credit is, and you can probably search for it on, on YouTube. But we hope it's engaging. Um, but what can we teach with it and how can we teach with it? Uh, so we have sometimes in astronomy classes, especially in university, have these labs that look at finding the age of some of these things. So we look at a picture, a real picture of the Crab Nebula from 1956 and we compare it to one from 1999 and we should see some growth, some evolution. And that way, by taking some measurements, we can actually find the time this actually went supernova, um, maybe the age of it. And that's great, but this takes a lot of time in the dome to do. It's a lot of math, and it kind of takes away from the planetarium experience in some ways. You can also, instead of finding age of these models, these um, nebulae, you can find the size of them. and you can do this with a lab again on paper. You can do it in a planetarium by flying through this model and letting the audience know the time that you're going, the, the speed that you're going um, and having them do some math by, if you start at the center, you're going a certain speed out of it and they can tell when it ends. They can maybe time that and do some math to see how big this is. But again, that takes a lot of time. And we don't really, oh, by the way, um, this is the Ghost of Jupiter Nebula, which we do actually have in our Sky Explorer system. And I'll show you this clip here flying into it. So we don't really have the time it takes to do a whole lab in the planetarium here. We've tried that. Um, we can certainly expand some of our astronomy university classes to include those, but really we just have 45 minutes to make a, an amazing impact. And we don't have time to turn the lights back up, have them do a math problem, and then turn the lights back down, have them look at the dome and all of that, right? So we really focus on engagement. And 
by looking at these objects from the outside then flying into them, hopefully that can give them a sense of awe, scale, and so on. So what do we actually mean by engagement? Um, can you put in the chat some words that are similar to engagement or that re are, um, you're reminded of when you think of engagement? So what else can we use instead of engagement? So there's interaction twice, participation, Recipro uh, reciprocity is a big one, I think, too, Noreen. Focus, feedback, minds on, enthusiasm, activeness, prediction and testing, attraction, inquiry. These are all really good. So interactivity, so the audience participation. Um, what else for engagement? What about inspiration? passion, motivation, enjoyment, there we go. An elevated mood, so enjoyment, um, quality of life, optimism, curiosity. So there's all these things that we can think of with engagement. And that's what we use here at Ball State to define a lot of different things that we do. Um, we focus on community engagement. Uh, we have engaging programs here. We have engagement opportunities here. Uh, and it's just a nice word to talk about lifelong learning and um, sharing our passion for things here in different um, theaters and in different ways. Um, so going back to, to models, how can we use them to really uh, promote engagement and to spark conversation in our planetarium experiences? Uh, so hopefully you can see kind of what we're focusing on here. It's a little pixelated on my screen, sorry if it is on yours. Um, but what are we flying into here? Probably no, you can put it in the chat. Let it go a little bit farther. Yeah, we're flying into Orion, but specifically this patch of Orion here. All right, so this is a nice uh, real photograph of the nice sky here. And we have the Orion Nebula that we're flying into, but they've actually created models, and a lot of you have used them, have seen them, of the Great Orion Nebula. How far away is this nebula? How far away is the Great Orion Nebula, not the Horse Head Nebula, which is very close, and um, it looks like we might be flying in there too, but not so fast, Carrie. About 1500 light years, 300 light years. Okay, so LY, right? Like that's a light year. It's about 6 trillion miles or so, right? In one light year. So it's a really long distance. Can we travel to this in real life? Nope, not yet. So we can't fly to it yet. Um, so we can take an imaginary trip and I'm sure you're all very familiar with flying through the Great Orion Nebula and we can really start to understand how vast it is. Because how wide is it? How large is that nebula? Does anyone know how wide it is? And you can uh, Google the answer if you want. So you can take your time, put into Google, how wide is the Great Orion Nebula? tens of light years across. No, like uh, it is, it is. It's about 30 to 40 light years wide. Great, yeah, someone Googled it and found it. Um, you might find the answer of like 25 light years wide, but it is quite, quite wide. Um, so if a spaceship is on one side of the nebula and it's trying to communicate to a spaceship on the other side of the nebula, it's going to have to wait about 30 years to be able to communicate, send one communication to it because it takes time for that communication to travel for that light that information to travel across it there's different types of engagement when we talk about it in education what types of engagement do you think there are so there's um intellectual engagement so me asking you some questions how far how wide these things are and then taking a trip to really appreciate that um, but what other types of engagement are there Kinesthetic, so uh, physical engagement, they call it. Emotional, social, yes. Cultural, that is a good one. It's not on my list, but it's great. Community building. I'll put a link to the engagement options in the chat so you can kind of explore them on your own. Um, but yeah, there's, there's all these levels of engagement that we could do. We have, um, a, um, the ones listed in the chat and then some others. And again, I'll just put the link up. But 
In the planetarium, uh, we have been creating these shorts for variable stars. And if you haven't seen them, um, we really try to capture the interest of the audience with some of these volumetric models that we have here. You just saw our Helix Nebula model to talk about the life cycle of stars. Um, so capturing that uh, attention and then going into some deeper understanding of it is what we've kind of been doing with those and they are free. Um, I've been told to ask you if uh, you have been using them to please let us know here so we can understand how many people are using them and then how. So if you have been enjoying our variable star episodes, just put a note in the chat, um, either to everyone or myself, but I went way over. So I'm just going to stop there and hand it off to Keith. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, so I am going to talk about uh, volumetrics and the public. Um, I I've got kind of a lot to say about this. We haven't done a lot of using volumetrics, but we have tried to use them. We are at a place where our computers for our system are fairly old, so they're struggling a little with some of the things that we've made. Um, but I'm going to try to tell you about some of the attempts that we have made to create some volumetrics and but also fold into that um how we uh how we want to think about working with the public on volumetrics because i think that's going to be very important to make sure that they understand what we're seeing so okay great so just to make sure everyone knows who i am um my name is keith davis i'm the director of the uh, digital visualization theater at the university of notre dame on the right is an image of our building that i shamelessly chose uh, stole shamelessly stole from our web page um we're a 50-foot sky scan divinity system with uh our old sony projectors that were installed in 2006 um, I, uh, my PhD is in physics specifically, but I got it doing astronomy and astrophysics. So I often come to a lot of presenting from a very physical science space uh, or, or thought process. Um, what's important to note is that I am in the College of Science, uh, not the physics and astronomy department. That means that I need to serve all departments. So I am always desperately begging for non-astronomy non content to use to teach classes and other things. Um, but I wanna start thinking about um, audience perception and give you an example of one of the first times this was made immediately clear to me. So, uh, if you look to the right, this is an image from my dissertation. It is a example of a shock wave moving through a molecular cloud. And tell me what it makes you think of in the chat or what you think you are looking at or any way you might describe this if you were telling about it, uh, telling someone about it later. So Carrie says it, it looks like an eyeball thermal map of the ocean. Okay, so there's that's interesting. There's some experience with other imagery that I'm connecting to here. Cooking eggs, solar wind, starry night, very wrong HR diagram. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so thanks for that feedback. Um, now what I'm going to tell you is that uh, I'm going to give you a little more background about how this image was made and see if that changes any of the responses. So this is a density map. So instead of saying it's a shockwave passing through a cloud, now I'm, I'm saying it's a density map of a simulation of a shockwave passing through the cloud. Um, and so what we did is we have a set of numbers, basically a grid on X and Y of some calculated numbers. And we have chosen to apply a color based on the density of material we have in that, um, in that particular square on the grid. If that changes how you think of this, please let me know. Now, do I think our audience is suddenly going to be able to do mathematics with this? No, um, but I have now highlighted that this is not actually density of a shockwave. It is a map of density of a shockwave, right? That I think hopefully bring some, oh, that's interesting. Andy is saying he's he was immediately assumed that the colors indicated heat. Very good point. If I tell you it's density as opposed to heat, um, does that help you understand it better? So I think the language we use when we use illustrations is important. Um, this conversation I have on the left, uh, a few years ago, I did a uh, workshop group, not really a workshop, but a discussion group amongst some designers, artists, and scientists. 
Um, and I showed this as an example of uh, imagery in science. And one of the designers says, why did you put that green line there? And I said, what green line? Also, I didn't put any lines anywhere. <laughs> and she me meant this sort of tan, what looks to me like a tan color right here, which is um, simply something that popped out of the rules-based setup that I put into this. And so sometimes some audiences will assume that you've made choices about making something look beautiful. Sometimes people will assume that you're showing them what is literally true. Um, but if we help people by, by, by when we're showing illustrations, if we help them by simply telling them what we did to get the diagram, I think that that can help them understand, I hope. And I think, Julie, that's a very good point that density is not a very well understood concept. And I would want to, to walk through that uh, with the audience if it were relevant, um, but I think we need to think about these things. So one of the things that I we have worked on because we need to do non-astronomy content is medical imaging. Um, so just as an example, there are several different kinds of medical imaging that people will often find themselves, you know, experiencing, right? This can be very, very visceral for people because they might be learning about whether or not they have a serious medical problem uh, and having to look at some images like this. So uh, some examples here are CT, which would be a form of X-ray, PET, which is positron emission tomography, SPECT, which is single photon emission, uh, computational tomography, I think is that, and then magnetic resonance imaging, all different ways of creating imagery of the body. Uh, so if we look here, and we, you can see that we get very different ways of seeing this. I'm going to click forward. This is a what's called a Z-stack. So we have dimension in the X and the Y, and then what I'm using in this animation for time is uh, actually just the third dimension. So because it's a two-dimensional uh, description here, we have to do the third dimension in terms of um, time instead of in space. So we have tried to build some of these, uh, and I'd like to tell you a little about how I've done that. Um, and the reason is that uh, I want you to think about the choices that were made in that process. So um, you start with some, so I would start with some sort of imaging source that was handed to me by someone in medical imaging. It would might be a 2D stack. Uh, there might be some calibration information. It might be uh, an animation. Um, I might have to split that stack into different separate images. I would then need to scale the Z dimension to the X and Y dimension to try to make sure these are, uh, are um, those are sort of dimensionally correct. And I'm always struggling with moving around the animation so I can see my old, or the movie so I can see my own uh, slides here. Then we would, we are building what's called a DDS, which is a format. I know very little about it um, other than that's what it's called. In my case, I loaded it into Digital Sky, but this would be any software that would render it. You might be using OpenSpace or one of the others. Uh, that would then calculate what to display, and then a rendering is projected in some way. Um, here is an example of the results of some of that. Uh, I really appreciated Nico and Wolfgang both highlighting the difference between a uh, surface and a volumetrics, because I think that's hard for the uninitiated to follow. Um, this here is an example of trying to do the exact same data as a surface, whereas, and this is a scan of a mouse, not a human being, so it's not a, <laughs> not a scrunched up human being, it's a mouse. Um, but there are three different sources of imagery that I have rendered, or my students actually rendered as a surface, and then we overlaid all of those. Um, this is our attempt to render those in um, uh, Digital Sky. So we've got CT, uh, SPECT, and some of the others that I talked about as well. Uh, so you can kind of see the different views you get out of that. Um, but I want to make sure, I want to highlight something that's really difficult when you start working on these images directly that I think can get lost when we just hand these images to presenters and don't let them think about how they are used. And that's that there are a lot of things happening when you make a choice about how to display these things. So uh, we have some variability in the source for um, uh, the image that you are handed. There is some kind of an imaging algorithm, for instance, a CT spins around the object spraying x-rays at someone's head or body and then 
has a camera recording how those uh, move through the body. And then some math must be done to turn that into a three-dimensional image. There are also contrast choices and scaling that you may not know anything about that you have to deal with. Um, what the heck is the DDS standard doing? <laughs> is it, I think um, uh, uh, Nico described the volume having opacity and brightness. Um, uh, and so maybe that's all the DDS is recording. And that's important to remember what lighting is Digital Sky imagining for this. Um, Nico talked about lighting coming from everywhere, but we need to think carefully about that. And then there are also uh, brightness and and color adjustments made simply when it is projected or put onto a monitor, right? So trying to understand what is really trying to be represented and what the audience sees. Now, I think there's one extra step that if I was not running out of time, I would ask you all to guess, um, but the audience member is doing some interpretation and we need to know what they think is happening to help them understand what we are trying to teach or show them. We all remember the dress fiasco. Um, uh, blue and black, white and gold. When I initially saw this, my thought was, well, it looks blue, uh, uh, white and uh, gold to me, but I don't know what's happening with the lighting, right? I, I had an advanced understanding because I think about these issues that the lighting matters. Um, but the point of that is that your brain will make decisions, but it will not tell you how it got to the decision. Mm. Um, here's another example of a visual illusion. And what I think is spectacular about this is that the image is black and white, the colored bands over it make your brain see a color that is not there. What I think is notable about that is that you can't really make it go away. Even when I tell you it is really black and white, it is very hard to not see the color, and that's an important factor of these sort of visualizations as well. Of course, if we zoom in, we see that there is no color in the image other than the bands. Um, there are some physics of lighting stuff that I wanted to remind everyone of that I will skip by. Um, but I think that what I want to end on here is that what we need in order to help our under audiences understand what we are seeing, what we are showing them, we need to understand the image format model and the rendering model. Uh, we need for creators to have a choice in lighting models. We need ways of reverting to earlier imagery to illustrate how the pretty volumetrics involve choices. I think we need to show the audience members that stuff. Say, this is the scientific image that the telescope took. Then we turn to that three-dimensional image and say, this is what we believe or calculate or estimate. I don't really think we should ever say this is what is really there. I think that's a lie. And I think we shouldn't give them the impression that we know what is really there. We can make measures of what is really there. And then we need to offer our audiences a general explanation of what they are seeing so that they can, in their own mind, interpret it better. So. Yeah, Keith, uh, your talk was very interesting and Danis as well. You're, you're touching on a few topics that have been interesting me a lot in the past, how people actually see the images that we show them. I did, we did some research in that uh, with a collaborator in, in Sweden as well. So the perception part, I think, is extremely important. And we need to help, as you say, the public or the viewer um, to get a better idea of what they are seeing. I had some very, very enlightening and uh, disturbing, in a way, experiences in that way that uh, people weren't actually seeing anything in the images that I was showing. <laughs> and it depended completely on their background, how close they were to physics, astronomy, or science in general, to what they were seeing. There were people who just were just seeing color you know, color structures and no interpretation mm -hmm. whatsoever of the image itself, itself, what was in the image. So you touched on a topic that I think is, is central to, to what we do in, in showing astronomy to the general public. And there's not much research on that. And especially on the 3D part, how to interpret 3D uh, models when we fly around them through them it's really hard i mean sometimes when i look at our models when we fly around them the brain just doesn't work out which way we are going or which way it's turning right. even say when i look at the orion nebula model that has a lot of dust in it 
uh, that should help us actually to do that. It sometimes takes uh, five to five seconds or so for my brain to understand what's going on when I fly around it. When we think about interaction, I think it's absolutely vital to check in with your audiences and see what they see what they are hearing. And I think that's a key part. This is about interaction. And I think that you need to ask your audiences what they think they're seeing. Um, I've also taken the time with audiences to make sure that they understand that the whole game of astrophysics is if we know how the light, how light can be produced and interact, then we can try to figure out what's physically going on at the space that made the light. Because I don't think that that's obvious to people unless they're connected to physics already. Mm -hmm. So that's right. Uh, yeah. Toshi is pointing out that um, color map data blue means cold. Yeah, uh, Toshi, that um, conversation I had with designers, there's been some discussion about uh, water is often on, on chemical or oxygen and water in chemical diagrams are, are often shown as red because oxygen is, is always as an atom is always shown as red, right? But that makes the audience think that that's not water because they think it's hot and water should be blue, right? Um, and so sometimes they argue with the designers about what they should be shown. And I think it really does matter what the audience is. Of course, you can also teach your audience things. I think we under, I don't know, maybe this is a source for research, but I think we under, um, underestimate how much our audiences are willing to learn if we're willing to actually tell them what they are seeing. But how much can we do in 45 minutes presentation? Sure. I think there's... Yes, exactly. Yeah. And each, each, each time it's a different, you cannot continue teaching it. It's always a different um, audience. So... Yeah, that's true. But I mean, that's our objective in general, teaching things and uh, we have to. Mm. But I think my point is that we cannot just show people pictures. I have talked to biologists mm -hmm. who say, I have an image and I've said, no, you have some numbers. Mm -hmm. You have some numbers that your telescope took or microscope took. And then we need to think about what we're going to do with those numbers, right? Not, you don't have a picture, you have some numbers. Um, yeah. which astronomers understand because they have to work a lot harder <laughs> to, to get their noise down than micro, micros, microscopists typically do. So. so one of my favorite things is um, remove to improve. So uh, keeping it simple, um, especially for people who are looking at these things for the very first time and giving them that chance to decode the information that we have encoded for them for the dome. Well, what are other people's interpretation or experiences with people interpreting images? Yeah, I wanted to add in that we often find that interpretation of the images to be a great teachable moment, as we call it, in that uh, whether it's a volumetric data or just even a, an optical image of the moon, there's a lot of different things to teach the audience about in discussion of it, let's say we turn on a, a high resolution uh, narrow angle camera image on the moon and it has a different contrast than our wide angle global image. Even just discussing why does it have a different contrast is the opportunity to talk about what is happening, how is this stuff collected, what is the science behind what they are looking at on the screen. and a lot of that can apply, whether it's an image, whether it's a volume, whether it's a like a false color image uh, mm -hmm. or a false color map. And so we, we actually like to discuss that as a yeah. teaching. It, the whole issue of false color images is, is terrible in a way. It's a very difficult subject for us, especially when we make models. We first have to decide which of the images are we going to reproduce. You no, know, and often, you know, uh, there are so many options and people might ask, well, why did you choose that one? I've seen it differently in, in, on the internet. Why are there five different versions of the same object, <laughs> different coloring? So which one is the actual photograph, you know, all that. And then there are often mixtures between X-ray, radio and optical and so on, infrared, and it, it 
becomes a whole mess. Of, yeah, I know. would in, I would encourage you guys to build an explanatory animation. And I don't mean necessarily something that has words, but take one of your final volumetrics, start with the image, the 2D image that you started with in like black and white or whatever, apply the, the color choices, apply the, and then I could in a planetarium say, so all of the things that you are seeing are representations of, of data and calculations that we've done. And then I could show, well, this is what the actual original tele uh, telescope image was. And then we made some choices to apply these colors to different wavelengths, or maybe even start with three different images or whatever. And then say, now we're inferring that light must be traveling through this, and then you bring it up, right? I think that's very, very helpful um, to have to just take away the curtain and let them see the guy behind it, right? And then when you show four or five of them together, you don't have to do that for every single one necessarily, but I think it's really valuable. What we usually do so far, thanks for the input, and uh, we will certainly try to improve this uh, kind of information as we pass on the, the models to the uh, those who integrate them, the, the companies. We usually provide an information sheet, not just a sheet, a text, that explains many of those things that you're mentioning, how we did it and what kind of data uh, was used. And we compare the origin, original image with the model and show different views uh, and explain these uh, to some extent. So I'm not sure if those actually are being passed on to the users or the presenters. So, but we, we can make an effort and uh, add those, for example, to our website uh, and add more information of, about the models in that sense. Um, kind of building off of what Keith said, we actually did a program um, all about Hubble uh, probably about seven years ago. And we actually used uh, Hubble's layering um, of one of the galaxies of infrared um, all the spectrums of uh, throughout the spectrum of light. And um, it was really nice to be able to show our audience how each different um, light band was able to add more information to the overall image. And it really helped explain that, you know, those images that you're seeing are a lot of information and sometimes we have to tease it apart. And it was a really cool talking point. Um, and it was one of my favorite things to talk to with the audience. So uh, forgive me if I'm saying your name wrong, but I think that was Jackie that just said that. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great example of, of what is sometimes seen as a flaw if you're coming at it from a movie perspective of it needs to be pretty and cool. And there's this illusion that we must not break. I think it's really an asset to break the illusion, right? Mm -hmm. I think that, that I hear a lot of people say, I never want to break the illusion break the illusion because the illusion is an illusion and when you're teaching science you need people to know that now this is this in part is uh, one reason why for example we introduced the slicing possibility in in Illuvia which even for for nebulae is great when you slice a nebula into just a, just a thin slice then it gives it opens a different view of everything you know it cuts it up and, and you see the interior in a very different way, cleaner. And uh, I think it sometimes helps even for galaxies, nebulae, uh, explain things in, in a different way. And then we could uh, have different, say for radio, the radio parts or X-ray parts, optical parts separate as separate models. And uh, if that can be, say, combined or mm, separated in the dome, as we, uh, we, it was mentioned, then they can be explained separately and, and then put together and make a holistic or, or a better image of the whole object. For example, the Centaurus A model that we have incorporates radio, X-ray and optical information. Um, is it... So regarding the DDS format that yeah. you mentioned, uh, which seems to be a bit of a black box, 
Nico might have a comment on that. Maybe you know more about the technical issues yeah, or, or the, what this is. Well, there's there's nothing really complicated about it. It's just a file that um, at the top it says how how big it is in width, height, uh, depth, and then it's a bunch of numbers which represent each voxel. So you have the red, blue, uh, the red, green, blue uh, opacity numbers for one voxel, followed by the red, blue, green opacity for the next voxel, and then there's a big long string of these numbers. And it just represents the colors of each voxel in space. And is it only opacity? It's not emissivity. Well, the red, red, green, blue channels are the colors, the emissive, emissivity channels. And then there's one opacity channel, the A channel. Oh, yeah. So there's just four numbers for each voxel, and they're all in a big long line, and you just read them out. And if you know how and it's eight, eight bits, right? Hmm? Uh, no, they, they can be floating point. Um, they can be floats or they can be integers. So the numbers can go from 0 to 255 or 0 to millions if you want. But usually we keep it to 0 to 255 because um, otherwise they're too big. If you have um, 512 cubed mm -hmm. times a floating point size, you get really large. Uh, really large values that most GPUs can't handle. 